morning, church. Welcome to MCBC Sunday Service. I'm Denise. And I'm Ambrose. Since it's Thanksgiving weekend, we wanted to invite you to think about one thing you're thankful for from God. I'm thankful for God's providence in our lives and providing us physical safety, uh, our home, and just uh, being able to continue to work in, in these uh, challenging times. I'm thankful um, that God has blessed us with a really amazing small group. Um, we've been going through Genesis together and having some in-person meetups and um, just grateful for really meaningful sharing and prayer. As you think about what uh, you're thankful for, we hope that it can help you to begin to see the way that God has continued to move in your life, even in these challenging times. And I know that for myself that uh, in this time that we have been separated, it can be so easy to, to overlook God, to not think about Him. And I hope that this is an opportunity for us to set our hearts in the right direction as we prepare to worship Him. And we're going to read from Psalm 103, uh, a psalm about praising the Lord and blessing His name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. In the Psalm, David, he talks about blessing the Lord. He blesses the Lord, and when he does, he remembers all the things that God has done and he remembers those things and, and, he, and it leads him to a place of wanting to worship the Lord. And we encourage you now that uh, as you think about the ways that God is good and that he has been good and to remember that he will continue to be good in our lives and because of that let, us, let, us, let it bring us to a place where we want to worship him truly because of who he is and that he is truly worthy of that praise.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my love, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in Scorn by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine.
Did you know in October is Pastor's Appreciation Month? It started in the 90s by focus on the family to recognize pastors and families and their work in the local church. But is it ever needed in these times? Pastor's burnout because of the pandemic has flown off the roof. Many pastors have left their church because of the political strifes within their congregation, especially those in the South, our neighbors. Things which used to be fairly black and white, such as racial reconciliation, taking care of the least of these, sexual abuse, power abuse, and even empathy has become polarizing topics, fueled by media from both the left and the right. And on top of that, we also have to man uh, manage expectations from congregations, boards, while also balancing our households, our relationship with our wife, our husband, our children. Marriage used to be that we're willing to sacrifice our marriage for the sake of the church. But nowadays, we have seen countless bones of children and wives sacrificed in the altar of the church. What's worse is this quote from a very prominent pastor's wife about her husband many, many years ago. And I quote, my husband is married to the church. While a month where a pastor is showered with love and encouragement and appreciation isn't at all bad, but is it sustainable? Or are we missing the obvious? We've been traveling back into the time of Ezra after the end of the exile of the Jewish people in our series, Return to Normal. Last week, Pastor Tim explored with us what returning to faithfulness might mean in the context of dating and marriage, because at that time, the Jews were intermarrying with the foreigners, and with that, they bring along their foreign gods when they should be exclusively worshiping God, the one true God. This week, we begin looking at the book of Nehemiah. Now, originally, Ezra and Nehemiah are created as one book and were later separated into two books in the English Bible. But just to remind ourselves the whole point of Ezra and Nehemiah, I can summarize it as this. Through the decree of Cyrus, the king of the Persian Empire, Ezra and Nehemiah is a historic account of the post-exilic Jews returning from Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple and the city walls in order to restore the worship of the Lord and preserve covenant faithfulness. The majority of the text is sprinkled with Aramaic, but the majority of it is in Hebrew. The text narrates selected episodes from the rebuilding of the temple and the wall. It speaks of the faith of Israel and the promise of God between the years of around 410 BC to 370 BC. As we start on the book of Nehemiah, 30 years have passed since chapter 10 of Ezra. And we'll be drawing a bit from it, but we're introduced to a new character whose name is the same as the book that is attributed to him, Nehemiah, or in Hebrew, the Lord has comforted. But the setting is not in Jerusalem, at least not in the beginning, but Susa, the stronghold of the Persian Empire, one of the many fortresses that the current king Artaxerxes I possessed through his vast rule. The book starts as one written by the prophets. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. Here's an account of Nehemiah. His ancestry is a bit of a mystery because nowhere does he or his father or even his brother Hanani is named elsewhere except in Ezra. Now Hanani could be a short form of Hananiah and he could be a son of Hakaliah, but he could also just be a kinsman from the same tribe. His name is a short form for uh, Hananiah, which means the Lord is gracious. A God who's gracious and a God who's a comforter. That's what's needed 
for that return of the exiles. Regardless, Hanani came to visit in the 11th month, possibly mid-November to mid-December time frame, in the 20th year of Artis Xerxes I's reign at his winter residence. They were from Judah, so could Nehemiah have also come from Judah, the tribe of King David? Nehemiah was concerned about the well-being of those who now live in Jerusalem after being returned. But what is it about this idea of escaping and surviving? Didn't Cyrus let the Jews go freely? Perhaps this is the point to those who remain from the initial exile to Babylon, who needed to live in the rubbles of Judah, and also a use of the remnant language to point to the words of the previous prophets. Now, remnant refers to the few faithful as opposed to the majority of Jews who have gone astray. And we see this language very prominently in the Old Testament, but particularly in the prophets. For example, in Isaiah 10, 20 to 22, it says, in that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord the Holy One of Israel in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For through your people, Israel, be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. Here is Hanani and the men's report. Nehemiah chapter 1, 3 to 4. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Trouble and shame. Those are gripping words of any culture, but particularly in a Middle Eastern context, honor and shame plays a huge role, huge role in everyday life. This is, after all, Jerusalem, the city of David, the once glorious witness of God's presence. The temple, though rebuilt, is not what it used to be. Recall Ezra 3, uh, the message on return to worship. The wall never even got a chance to be built up from the rubble before oppositions came in and stopped the whole work. Thus, the temple now and its inhabitants are exposed to ridicule and possible invasion and looting at any time. The former wall before the exile meant Israel could defend themselves, but now they're at the mercy of the elements and the warring factions that are around them. The gates through which you can enter deeper into the city, the doors and the gates to the mystery of God's city are now charred black by the ravaging fire of yesteryears. It reminds the Jews of the pillage and shame when Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar came in and with one fellow swoop and destroyed the city. He captured the Israelite kings and royal households and dragged them to serve as his own slaves. And those left behind were people who could barely fend for themselves. This was to complete the ridicule so that all hope is lost. Nehemiah, having heard all this, is moved to tears and so overcome with emotion, he had to sit down and mourn as though someone close to him has died. But not as so much for the building, because of the state of the building, as important a role as that served as a symbol of prestige and a place of safety, no, he was mourning for what the inhabitants must be feeling, desperate, defeated, and despondent. However, it may be precisely this news that brings about God's action. Was there ever a time when you have been so stirred by something that led you into a stage of grief. Let me be more specific. How are we doing as an English congregation? Is there anything within our congregation that so troubles you, that so bothers you, that it causes you to be paralyzed with sadness or disappointment? If not the congregation, maybe it's a person in your family. Maybe it's an issue in society, such as homelessness, or indigenous people that 
were ravaged by the residential school system. Maybe it's climate change and how it's destroying crops and ruining the livelihoods of people in the third world who could barely fend for themselves. Or how the rich are getting more rich, creating tax havens and the whole thing with the Pandora Papers. What do we do when the odds are so overwhelming, the invisible oppressive forces are so huge, and we are feeling so small? See, here's the point. Nehemiah has a God-sized problem which requires a God-guided solution, and that solution is prayer. Nehemiah has a God-sized problem which needs a God-guided solution, and that solution is prayer. There are two parts to his prayer, two aspects to our own prayer in returning to normal and returning to God. Our first point, one, we remember God's holy character and bring our knees into confession. We remember God's holy character and bring our knees to confession. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayers of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servant, confessing the sins of the people which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah begins not by drawing up a plan immediately with Hannah and I or making an emotional decision, though he was emotional, to head back to Jerusalem at once or blame God for how things have turned out. He goes to prayer, earnest prayer, of focus, including fasting. In his prayer, he recounts that God is the ruler of heaven, great in power and awesome in might. He keeps his covenant and steadfast love. And this covenant language is found all throughout Deuteronomy in Moses' writing, but particularly in Deuteronomy 7, 9. See the similarity from what was just read. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Or also look at the exilic prophet Daniel, verse 9 to 4 in Daniel. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandment. This is tried and tested covenant language. Perhaps here is actually the right time to talk about what is a covenant. See, a covenant is an ancient contract between two parties, one called the suzerain, the other called a vassal. Now, the suzerain is the higher power who gives what is needed, whereas the vassal is of a lower power as the receiver of the benefits. There would be then a preamble which would say something about the greatness of the suzerain, followed by the stipulations of the contract. And this is furthered uh, followed by blessings if the contract is fulfilled or curses if one party violates the contract. Applying it to here, obviously the Lord is the suzerain and Nehemiah on behalf of his people are the vassal. This language should be familiar become, because a more familiar covenant is the one between Moses and the Lord. If you read Deuteronomy, the whole book is written in the context of a covenant. Or the Abrahamic covenant, if you recall how God's spirit goes between that slain bull that was cut in half, which was the result or the curse if you violated this covenant, and God willingly took that punishment, as he ultimately did by sending his son to the cross. And of course, David's covenant, that as long as the descendants of David remain faithful, there would always be a king and a kingdom of David forever. The exile happened precisely because Israel is in idolatry. They were exploiting the poor and therefore incurred a curse which God has delayed and delayed yet written so clearly in the book of Deuteronomy. And until his patience wars out and justice must be executed, 
they were exiled. Nehemiah is recalling this covenant and admitting how he and his whole people and his whole ancestry has violated the love him exclusively clause and to keep his and obey his commandment. It is to take upon himself the guilt of the whole people and intercede on their behalf. So the first step to returning is to remember who it is we're standing before and where we are in standing before him. A God-sized problem requires a God-guided solution through prayer. Perhaps our first step before returning to normal, returning to worship, returning to challenges and faithfulness, is returning to prayer in a humble act of confession. No, we did not cause the pandemic, but perhaps, yes, we have reacted to the pandemic with faithlessness and distrust, fear and doubt. And while all those experiences are understandable, they will continue to paralyze us from action if we don't confess. God wants us to be free of the guilt and the shame, the complacency and apathy towards being part of the community. What is it that's hindering us from the excitement of being part of the English congregation again? No, not just to attend, but to participate and dive into ministry as things begin to return to that new normal. And this leads to our second point. We recall God's mercy and remember his faithfulness. We recall God's mercy and remember his faithfulness. Nehemiah chapter 1, 8 to 11. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost part of heaven, From there, I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was a cupbearer to the king. See, this last verse, in some Bible translations or Bible versions, belong into the next chapter, into chapter 2, while some of them put it right at the end of the first chapter. I prefer this latter, that is, putting it into the end of the first chapter, because it leaves us with a cliffhanger to realize that God has indeed already placed a solution in the midst of King Artaxerxes at least for 20 years since his reign. It is Nehemiah himself as the cupbearer who both tastes the king's food to ensure that it has not been poisoned and to even handle some of the king's financial affairs. In other words, this Jewish man, by God's providence, has risen to a trusted position besides the greatest power in that known world at that time. And in chapter 2, next week, with Reverend Alvin again, we will see how Nehemiah risked his place with the king for such a time as this. This explains then what is he praying from verse 8 to 10. He first continues a bit in verse 8 to talk about the curse, but starting in verse 9, he recounts to God, not that God is forgetful, Uh, But as a representative of a vassal, he is using covenant language. He is recounting to God the stipulation of the return. If, after idolatry, exploitation, and corruption, the Jews were to repent and return to God and to obey his laws, again, Nehemiah is drawing from Mosaic law in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 to 5, but particularly in verse 4. If you outcasts are in the uttermost part of heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. Which is a word-to-word equivalent uh, to the same part that we just read in verse 8. And if you combine that with Deuteronomy 12, 5, which he says, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go. 
and to finish it off with Moses' intercessory prayer for Israel on Mount Sinai from Deuteronomy 9.29. For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out by your great power and by your outstretched arms. See, you're seeing that Nehemiah is basically drawing from the resources of his ancestors, of prayers that he has heard that God has answered. Nehemiah, in his prayer, is reliving the Mosaic prayer of the past and bring it into power today. God can be trusted to keep his covenant uh, and promises to gather his people no matter how much he has scattered them for their disobedience, to be their God and for them to be his people. To have a focal point where God will be worshipped and where his name shall be made known and have been saving his people again and again since the days of Exodus, under the hands of another oppressive force, Pharaoh of Egypt. The same calamity, but a different king. And yet we have the same God who offers the same mercy. Nehemiah is basically saying, if this is going to work, if indeed the walls are need to be rebuilt, and they are going to need to be rebuilt, the people need to have their hope renewed, the remnant to truly believe they are favored by God and will be witnesses to all the nations, it's not going to be up to me. I will do what you ask, but it's in your power and your steadfast love and on your condition that this will happen. Otherwise, like Moses bargained with God uh, when God was about to abandon his people, Moses said this, right? If you won't go with us, I'm not going to go any further. Not because Moses was disobedient, but because he knows, as now Nehemiah knows, as we should also know, that only God, only you, God, can bring us there, and in you can there be any hope of not only rebuilding walls, but more importantly, for rebuilding the nation of Israel so that He will be their God, and we will be his people. The same is true of us today. Perhaps we have relied too much on our own strength when it comes to trying to return to normal. I mean, this is not to discount the work that everyone has put to make it closer and closer to a reality. But when was the last time we prayed for all our ministries one by one? and lift them up and intercede on their behalf, knowing if God's power is not there, our sermon is but pep talk, Sunday school is but a people's opinions, small group is a social gathering, and children and youth ministry but a mere holy babysitting service. There has to be something more. One way for us to not be forgetful, as the Israelites were is to be actively recounting the blessing we have already received and celebrate it. Have we not remembered? Have we forgotten already how God led us through paying off the building debt? And it's right before the pandemic hit. Have we forgotten how God has blessed us with faithful teams of pastors in all the congregation when we ask for it? And surely in the future when we ask for More pastors and more deacons and more leaders God will provide. Have we forgotten how he took us through that trying time when we had our senior pastor secession, and yet he was able to maintain our unity as one church through it all? Remember God's faithfulness. He hears and listens. And now I want to share with you personally. Brothers and sisters, I need your prayers. I need you to pray for my personal ministry to my wife, to you, and to my fellow team members. I need you to pray for every message that I preach, from the conception of it in research to writing it and delivering it. Yes, of course I will put out my utmost effort in making sure that I'm accurate in my interpretation, making the message easy to understand and relevant to our needs, as a congregation, but I can't be the only one who prays for it to make a spiritual impact. And honestly, it won't make a spiritual impact to you if you aren't willing to pray with me. It is but a man-made invention. 
partner with me by praying, and you may even begin to experience God's work in the truth despite this broken and imperfect vessel who is delivering it. So pray for your pastor that when he, he and if he sins, that when and if he sins, God will convict his heart so quickly he would not be disrupted with that sweet fellowship that he longs to have with the Lord. Pray that when he makes a mistake that he will humble himself and be quick to accept faults and make changes. Pray that he has wisdom to make difficult decisions. Pray that he has the favor of those he works with and ministers to, not because he wants to be popular, though the temptation is always there, but so he can nurture and develop a team to minister to one another and the team to himself or herself. Now apply this by taking out the word pastor and replacing it with a deacon, uh, with a small group leader, maybe even starting with your own name. Then maybe the worship team, our mission board, our council members. And here's the truth as well. Sorry for being a little more direct. When I came to MCBC, the first thing that I started immediately was to attend the prayer meeting, which used to happen on a Tuesday evening. For some of us, we may remember that, but was later moved to Saturday. It's something ingrained in me before I was even a pastor from my previous church to find that corporate space of prayer that is happening in a local church and be a part of it. It, it, that is this Saturday prayer meeting I talked about, right now averages four people. But these four people have not stopped praying since its inception. Besides the fellowship that we shared over a decade, I can honestly say that if I didn't attend that prayer meeting and and if I weren't a pastor, I would not know what to pray for in our ministry. I mean, sure, we can pray in our small groups. And in fact, I would encourage you to pray in your small groups. But small group prayers are usually relegated to small group needs or personal needs. But the ministers and leaders behind each ministry need you too. The missionary we support overseas needs you as well. We now have three prayer meetings at different days and different times, in different intervals. Three opportunities to partner with us for the sake of the gospel and to seek God to strengthen our ministry to you and yours to us. There, every pastor and leader share their heart struggles. We celebrate God's answered prayers and continue to fervently pray for children and youths and parents, singles, married, students, other pastors, caring ministries, small groups ministry, so that they will be in the forefront of our mind and that we will be aligned to God's agenda. Maybe we need a paradigm shift. Instead of that personal prayer time being the priority, which happens every day, Maybe make a priority to join one of these prayer meetings, corporate prayer meetings where we gather as a larger body and make that your priority for the month. See, God has already mapped out a way for our return. We have to set, already set the date of Sunday, October 24, to have our in-person as well as online service. But between now and then, and beyond our return. What we need is your prayer in all settings, but in our prayer meetings especially to ignite the spiritual flame, to awaken our souls for the passion to worship God, equip the saints, serve others, and proclaim the gospel together as the body of Christ. And you know what? That would be the best gift for any pastors during a pastor's appreciation month. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may we return to prayer. Not just prayers for individuals, though that is greatly needed in our community, for those who are sick, for those who are hurting, for those who are struggling, but also know how to pray for our pastors, 
for our deacons, for our council members, for our ministry leaders, for our small group leaders, for the ministry that is going on, the ones that you want to birth out, but you're looking for faithful people to join you and partner with you and understand your will to execute these wonderful ministries, Lord. Lord, we admit we can't do it on our own. And therefore, we rely in your spirit to invigorate and to challenge us to pray and to pray boldly. So, Lord, challenge us with what needs to be challenged. Convict us with what we need to change. And give us the courage to live that out today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, MCBC. Welcome to our online service. My name is Daniel, and here are a few of this week's highlight announcements. Our first two announcements is coming from Driven Worship. Um, so in light of Pastor Tim heading back to full-time studies at the end of November, uh, Driven Worship is going to be needing some volunteers to help teach. And so if there are any congregant members or parents who want to help out, um, please contact Pastor Tim on how you can help. Um, Driven Worship is also going to be resuming in-person services uh, starting on October 17th, and it's going to run from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. in room B33. And so if you wish to attend in person, uh, please pre-register on the church website, and also uh, you'll need to perform a COVID screening test on Sunday morning prior to attending in person. Uh, for Fall Fest this year, um, this is going to be held online. And so the MCBC Children's Ministry has uh, provided a um, baking uh, project that we're going to all participate in. And so this year they're going to be doing an apple crisp. And so if you want or are interested in participating, um, you'll need to register online uh, no later than October 24th. Um, and then on Saturday, October 30th, between 10 and 4 uh, PM, you'll be able to pick up all your supplies that they have prepared. And then the actual uh, baking all together on Zoom uh, will happen on Sunday, October 31st from 2 to 4 PM. Um, one final note um, for the Walk for Promise at Nokia Trail. Um, due to weather forecast, um, this event has been postponed um, until uh, Saturday, October 16th. And those are all of our announcements for this week. Um, happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week.